After two and a half tedious years stuck to the surface of the earth since the catastrophe of Columbia, plus another 13 frustrating days grounded by a faulty sensor, it was finally business as usual just after 10.30 in the morning for Space Shuttle Discovery. Discovery 2, go ahead. Okay, Elaine, our long wait may be over. Uh, so on behalf of the many millions of people who believe so deeply in what we do, good luck out to and have a little fun up there. Seven, six, five, three engines up and burning. Three, two, one, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Discovery, beginning America's new journey to the moon, Mars, and beyond. And the vehicle has cleared the tower. If this is what you call usual. Roger, roll, Discovery. Houston's now controlling. Commander Eileen Collins confirming Discovery's rolling onto a course for rendezvous with the International Space Station. Already accelerating to 100 miles per hour in the few seconds it takes to clear the tower, Discovery would race in just eight and a half minutes time from a speed of zero to almost 18,000 miles per hour. Three engines on Discovery are now throttling down to two-thirds throttle to prepare the spacecraft to pass through the area of maximum air pressure and go supersonic. Only eight and a half minutes from standing still here in Florida to an orbit round the Earth. One minute since launch, Discovery speed now 900 miles per hour. Discovery Houston, go at throttle up. Discovery, just go with throttle all systems remain go for Discovery, altitude now nine miles, six miles northeast of the launch pad. NASA finally has overcome the crippling loss of the seven Columbia astronauts with a mandate once again for exploration deeper into space and for the pursuit of scientific and medical advances that could change our lives here on Earth. For discovery on this long-awaited morning of the launch, the intricate preparations for flight are a familiar feeling. She is not only the oldest of NASA's three surviving shuttles, she is the most experienced. As discovery sat in the light of the rising sun, she was poised to take her 31st flight. And just as discovery becomes the first to take to the sky after the disintegration of Space Shuttle Columbia in 2003, she was also the first to fly after the explosion of Space Shuttle Challenger almost 20 years ago. For the astronauts finally boarding Discovery, this launch was a long time coming. Not just a long two and a half years since Columbia, but also a long 13 days since they had done this very same thing before. Eastern, uh, Eastern Range reports uh, everything's go at this point, and uh, visibility problems that we observed uh, yesterday are not present today. The original date, of course, was July 13th. Aside from a handful of small but solvable glitches, weather seemed to be the only thing that threatened the possibility of a delay. But then, when the last astronaut was just about to be strapped into his seat, with only two and a half hours left till launch, a fuel sensor, one of two million working parts, a tiny bit of hardware that could erroneously tell the shuttle's engines to stop, put a hold on the whole operation. Give a go to unstrap. Copy that, we'll push that and work. The mission for July 13th was scrubbed. But NASA's administrator put the best possible face on what happened, saying, this is the way things are supposed to work. What you've seen today is a success story. You've seen us process a launch, come across a problem, identify it, and, and, and back out safely and soundly. Come together for it. Uh, the vehicle, the eco-sensors, uh, for some reason, did not behave today, and so we're going to have to scrub this launch attempt. So uh, once we develop our, our scrub turnaround plan for you, obviously we'll get that back to you. So I appreciate uh, all we've been through together, uh, but this one is not going to result in a launch attempt today. Then, through almost two weeks of exhaustive examination, Discovery never left the launch pad. 
Eventually, engineers believed they could deal with the problem, and the launch team decided to proceed. But this left the shuttle with only six days to get off the ground before another potential six-week delay because of the safety requirement for a visible daylight-only launch and a launch window requirement that would allow for a link up with the orbit of the International Space Station. That's because in the aftermath of Columbia, the space station is now Discovery's safe haven in case any insulation tiles do crack. The astronauts could stay there for up to eight weeks until another space shuttle rescues them. So reaching the space station isn't just a goal, it's a necessity. This is shuttle launch control at T-minus three hours and holding. We're down now to the final five minutes of this planned built-in hold. Now, finally, the stars align for NASA and the countdown resumes. Space shuttle Discovery is primed to fly for the second time in the month of July. By the middle of the night, the dangerous and delicate fueling process is again underway. At five in the morning, after medical checks and final briefings, the astronauts gather for their second meal already. They had had their wake-up call at half past midnight, when most Americans who will cheer them on were just going to sleep. Dr. Charles Camarda, a rookie, but at 53, the second oldest astronaut on this mission. Second, the other rookie and the youngest on the mission, Soichi Noguchi from the Japanese Space Agency. He's one of the two astronauts trained to do three spacewalks before they come home. And Andy Thomas, his fourth mission, including one where he spent 130 days on an international crew in the first Russian space station. Fifth, but first in the chain of command, and the first woman to command a space shuttle flight, which was back in 1999, retired Air Force Colonel Eileen Collins. Then, shuttle pilot and Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Jim Kelly, an astronaut for 10 years. This is his second flight as pilot. Finally, Steve Robinson, the other spacewalker as well as flight engineer. He has been an astronaut for more than 10 years, an employee of NASA for 30. This is shuttle launch control where we see the STS-114 astronauts leaving the suit up room headed for the elevator down to the first floor from the astronaut quarters in the operations and checkout building. They leave the building suited up and psyched up, just as they did 13 days early. The weather looks good for the mid-morning launch, only a 10% chance of a scrub, which is a big relief. Anything within 20 miles, lightning, thunder, wind, rain, heavy cloud cover, anything that might threaten or even obscure a clear view at the time of the launch would mean another delay for 24 hours or more. But this time there would be no grounds for delay. This time they would get off the ground and on day three of the mission, they would link with and deliver 29,000 pounds of gear to the International Space Station more than 200 miles above the Earth. It takes about 10 minutes for the heavily guarded vehicle that carries the astronauts to cover the three miles from their lodgings to pad 39B. 95 foot level. Finally, after riding an elevator up to a platform 195 feet above the ground, the astronauts step onto their last earthbound perch, what they call the white room. This is where final adjustments are made on the suits the astronauts wear for liftoff and reentry suits they can remove the moment they reach their orbit. 
This is also where they give their last pre-flight handshakes and wave their last goodbyes, and where the astronaut from Japan gives a few visual plugs for his Japanese space agency before crawling into their spacefaring home for the next 12 days. Our commander preparing to board. The astronauts are sent into the shuttle in the order that they can reach their seats. That's why Commander Eileen Collins goes first. The left front seat in the shuttle is hers. Then the first crew member to what they call the mid-deck, mission specialist and aerospace engineer in civilian life, Charlie Camarda. Next, shuttle pilot Jim Kelly. He flies from the right front seat. The fourth to board, Andy Thomas. He's married to a woman who's a candidate for the astronaut corps. Now the other woman on the crew, Wendy Lawrence. She's in charge of the cargo that Discovery is carrying to the International Space Station. Then the showman from Japan, Soichi Noguchi. He's actually the second Japanese astronaut to ride an American shuttle into space. Last into the spacecraft, flight engineer Steve Robinson. But he'll be the first one out for the initial spacewalk on day five of the mission. Each astronaut is helped into place by sanitized technicians. Zero gravity will be a relief because here on the ground, gravity works against them. Each sinks onto the parachute that might be needed for a quick after launch abort. And each has a waistband thick with survival gear. These astronauts are also carrying personal mementos from the families of the seven astronauts who died in Columbia. Discovery's crew will sit in these positions or lay back in them for more than two hours. And we see the hatch being closed right now. At 9 o'clock straight up, the support crew outside shuts the hatch. The astronauts are sealed in alone. Less than two hours to lift off. Strapped into their seats, poised to blast off into space, the astronauts know from years of training that this is a risky business. Yet by rights, with all the innovations after Columbia, this should be the safest shuttle that has ever flown. However, exactly one hour before liftoff, NASA's astronaut training aircraft, its airborne shuttle simulator, overflies the launch site, testing the landing approach that Discovery will have to take if in the first few seconds of flight, it must abort.
calls that Discovery could reach its planned orbit on only two engines if needed. All three continue to operate well at full throttle. Just under two minutes to cut off of the main engines now. Discovery Houston, we see a nominal shutdown plan. You will be go for the plus X and go for the pitch maneuver. The first minutes after launch have triumphs, objectives, and decisions by the second. The role of the spacecraft, the separation of the solid rocket boosters, the choice about which backup landing strip they can reach if one engine comes. Among the many safety innovations since the collapse of Columbia are lasers, radar, sensors, and more than a hundred cameras to document every square inch of discovery that could have been damaged during launch. And that includes 10 high clarity, high definition TV cameras provided and wired by HDNet. Cameras were trained on the shuttle from the ground and from the sky in two NASA aircraft that watched as long as they could. All the data that all this paraphernalia collects will be analyzed closely before any attempt is made to bring discovery back down to Earth. While in orbit, whether they suffer any damage or not, the astronauts will test three of NASA's newly invented tile repair procedures. No one knows yet if they'll really work in space, though. They'll test them, but they won't depend on them. five more years of shuttle flights on NASA's schedule. By then, the shuttle technology will be 30 years old. A newer, more modern vehicle is already on the drawing boards. But this day, everything America plans to achieve in space is riding along with the astronauts on the shuttle, and specifically on this so-called test flight. My heart's been in my throat all morning. It's been a great day. And, uh, and to think that here we are today, with Americans back in flight on an American vehicle uh, is just a tremendous step and, and it'll be the first in many steps as we head out into the exploration of the solar system back to the moon and on to Mars. And then his team showed the kind of spirit and dedication um, to overcome difficulties that that is going to take and I couldn't be more proud of them. It's a great day. For now, the space shuttle is still, as NASA's administrator puts it, the most magnificent piece of transportation equipment man has ever developed.